I once had a client explain this in a way and I just went, you know what, that explains exactly what it's like. She's like, I'm okay, but I'm living with pain. And I just went, that's exactly what it's like. I was, I was, I was okay, I was getting on with things, but I was living with pain. And I was living with grief that no one could see. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking Podcast. Today's interview is with Natalie Cross, who's a former psychologist here at Strategic Psychology. And she's been really open about discussing her experience, her lived experience around recurrent uh, miscarriage and, and, and the loss that she's experienced and what that's been like for her. It's an absolute fantastic episode. It's very raw. You know, Natalie's been kind enough to, to talk about what it's been like for her, not only as, as a, you know, a psychologist, really more so as a human and, and, and as a first time, you know, mum. So I think you're going to get a lot out of this one and it's a fantastic episode. So enjoy. Natalie, welcome to the Better Thinking Podcast show, and I know that today we're going to be talking about something that's quite uh, challenging and, you know, I think in some sense confronting. It's a, it's a hard story, but in some sense a common uh, story, I think, uh, for, for many, and I really appreciate your, your time coming on to, you know, what I think is going to be, you know, a, a, a uh, in some sense a tough uh, uh Topic, but uh, a really important topic. So, with, without you know further ado, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Nash. Thanks for having me. Look, uh, you know, we obviously have a little bit of a uh, history, which I think it's put to we put we put on the uh, table first. Uh, first of all, we sure thanks do. for coming back into <laughs> the office. Uh, you're previously a psych here at Strategic Psychology, which is you know fantastic, and gone off to uh, you know, let's just call it better pastures. <laughs> Never, uh, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, we've been talking recently about, uh, I, I suppose, the world of, uh, in some sense, motherhood and and the, the lead up to that, and 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 you know, I suppose the harder uh, uh, aspects or topics in that. Um, maybe I can kind of pass it over to you about talking about lived experience. You know, for 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 this episode, lived experience of what. Uh, what are that, that common story can be like uh, if I'm not maybe stepping out of, out of line, but uh, what it might be like for, for many and, and to be able to share that um, with others. So, you know, may, maybe you can kind of introduce that a little bit. And In relation to motherhood? Yeah. 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 So um, I am a mum of a beautiful, almost three very challenging little boy. Um, his name is Elijah. It's more um, than three almost already. Yeah, same as your little one, about wow. a, a week before. Yeah, yeah. I think so, oh, yeah. that's they're, right. Yeah, that's they're very right. close together. Um, so um, I suppose this will make sense a little bit later on the podcast as well, but um, so my husband and I fell pregnant with Elijah. He was a little bit of a surprise. Um, we had only been together for about a year and a half, so not – not a significant amount of time, and my husband was just about to get deployed to Iraq. He is in the army, so a pregnancy was well, definitely that's, not that's, on our cards. That's starting to make a bit of sense as to how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we won't go into those details. Um, private life is so private life, but um, yeah. So uh, um, yeah, we found out uh, quite early on that we were pregnant with our son Elijah. Um, so. I went through the pregnancy. We had a quite an a, quite a easy pregnancy. We obviously fell pregnant with him very easily. We weren't trying. Um, v- relatively easy pregnancy. No real issues, to be honest. We were very, very blessed. I think the worst thing that I had was some, some pretty bad sciatica. Um, but other than that, really, really, really easy pregnancy, which was lovely. What What is an easy pregnancy? Um, easy for me was just, and I suppose in hindsight, is just not really having any kind of scares or really big issues at the end of the day. So every time, so I did have some quite bad morning sickness at the start. Um, that's pretty common. I think it's about 80% of women do get morning sickness. Um, mine was 
pretty rough. I ended up losing about five kilos in the first trimester um, because I just, from about two o'clock in the day, I just could not eat. Um, And I would spend the entire night dry reaching, which when you're trying to act as a psychologist and be there present, but you are trying not to also dry reach in session as well, was quite difficult, but I managed to keep it together and no one knew. So that that was good. Um, Is, Is it kind of like nausea? It's kind of like a really bad hangover like, is kind oh. of the best way to describe it. Um, you're very tired, very lethargic. Um, some women do throw up. I never actually did. Um, I know like for my sister, she just felt very queasy through a lot of the day, but I dry reached a lot. So um, you kind of feel like you're on the verge or you can get to that point where you're on the verge of wanting to vomit yeah. and, and for some – there is Some actually vomiting. do. I would spend about two or three hours a night with my head in a bucket just dry reaching because nothing would actually come up. Um, so that was that was and, challenging. And this is the good? Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's quite normal. normal. It's not good. It was never good. Um, but it's, it's quite normal. It is kind of what I expected. My mum had some pretty horrendous morning sickness. My grandmother had very bad morning sickness and had it through most of all of her pregnancies. So that was no shock to me at the end of the day. But I did start feeling better around the 14-week mark. But what I mean by easy was just every time I went to my obstetrician, um, they just kept telling me how healthy he was. He was growing really well. He was a big baby. Um everything was was fine in that regard. There was never any concerns for his health. Um, and that's kind of what I mean more by, by yeah, easy in the fact is there was never, I know from watching a lot of my girlfriends go through this, that some babies will stop growing at a certain rate and they have to get induced or they will have issues with the growth or anything like that or any kind of concerns or from even ultrasound. the apprehension, you know, it's kind of like, yeah. oh, this might be a little bit off, you know, that might not be showing what we want it to. And exactly. then we naturally go, oh my goodness, first timers you know, is, is, is everything okay, so on and so forth. Yeah. It, it kind of can be quite uh, daunting when you don't know. Yeah, we did have a bit of a scare at the start of the pregnancy um, because we weren't trying, obviously I had no idea what my dates were. So they generally map your pregnancy from the date of your last period and that's kind of what they call your egg cycle. So that's when the cycle of the baby starts. Um, because I wasn't tracking that because we weren't trying, I had absolutely no idea what that was. So we did get sent in for an early scan to do a dating scan to see what my due date would be. Um, and I thought I was around six, six and a half weeks at the time. Um, turns out I was only about five, five and a half. How do they do that? Because our dates changed as well. I, I don't I don't know. Look, it, our bodies aren't – we're not robots no, at the end of the day. No. Like our bodies are all different. They say it takes 12 to 14 days after fertilisation for then the egg to implant. But, like, at the end of the day, not everyone falls within that category. It, There's yeah, got to yeah. be some science behind it. But, um, like I said, we're not robots. We're all different. Yeah. We will implant at different times at the end of the day. So your dates can get thrown out. And we don't all ovulate right on 14, the 14th day of your cycle either. Some people have different longer cycles. Everyone's body is really, really different. And it can, so take, it's not time. A, it can take time for the sperm to reach the egg as well. Yeah, that doesn't exactly. have to happen on, you know, the the, the uh, day or night or... The O-day, the, the as O-day. a lot of people call it. Is that what they call it, the oh, O-day? Yes, in, in, in all the blogs and everything that I have been in for a very long time now. Um, that's what a lot of people call it. I don't know, I never did. It was game day, honey, let's go. Um, <laughs> is what it ended up being when we started trying. Um, but so, yeah, look, everyone is really different. So we um, we got put back a little bit, but unfortunately we did have quite a bad doctor at that point who told us that we had miscarried um, and tried to book me in for what they call a DNC, which is a dilation and curatage, which is a surgical procedure where they take the fetus who has what has perished or has failed to develop out. Okay. Now, because... The ultrasound tech had told us, look, you're very likely too early because you don't know your dates. Wait two weeks, come back in, we'll probably be able to see more. So I had very conflicting evidence. I said, well, look, there's no – I think it's way too early to be booking that in. I'm just going to wait for the two weeks. And I was still rottenly sick. How were you feeling at that point? That must have kind of shaken you up a bit. Yeah, I remember – um, trying to go to work after that meeting and crying the whole way from Bondi. If anyone lives in Sydney, I was about an hour from Bondi to Miranda and I cried the whole way and got there and went, I can't counsel anyone. Like I'm a mess. I can't do this. Um, and I suppose my husband being in the army, he does go away quite a lot. So he wasn't there at that point either. So I was on my own. Um, so I just turned around and went home. Um, and I pulled out the report from the ultrasound and it said, 
the viability of the pregnancy is yet to be determined. I just went, look, I think this doctor's jumping the gun. I still have significant pregnancy symptoms. I was so, so sick, very tired. I was like, there's no possible way this pregnancy isn't going. But it was a really anxious two weeks. What did you do on that day when you went home? I cried for a very long time. Um Again, and then just started the process of dry reaching all night again. Oh um, and just kind of the next day, just kind of, I think I talk, I would have talked to family. I remember calling my sister, I believe, and kind of having a chat with her. Um, and everyone just kind of saying, well, look, we don't have any answers yet. Um, the text said to wait two weeks. Let's just wait two weeks. So we did do that. Um, like I said, it was a, an anxious two weeks, but just kind of focused on getting through that. Um, and lo and behold, there was my now son, Elijah, perfectly healthy um, with a very angry technician who was very angry at the doctor for telling us that we had miscarried and very grateful that we didn't actually book in the DNC. So um, that was kind of, I suppose, the worst part of the pregnancy with Elijah, really. And that was a two week period. Um, and I must say, Elijah is absolutely, you know, gorgeous. He's a gorgeous. funny little bugger. Uh, he's, yeah, he's mad. He's yeah, mad. He's I'll, mad. I'll, 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 running uh, up the halls of this I'll place a couple months ago. <laughs> <laughs> was not as well behaved as your girls at all. He's definitely got a lot of spunk and personality. I <laughs> don't know who to blame that for, whether it's my husband or myself, um, probably a little bit of both. Um, but no, he's a, he's a beautiful little boy. So um, I did have to have a C-section with Elijah um, purely for the fact that I have a very, very narrow pelvis um, and he was ginormous. Um, he was 55 is, centimetres long. Is pelvis got to do anything with uh, your size? Because you are, you know, small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, I just have a very small frame. So I know from previous surgeries that I've had my doctor saying I have very thin bones and a very, very small frame, um, which I was very upset with him at the time because I could not blame. Bigger, if you're a bigger person, you know, taller, so on. Yeah, bigger do, hips. Does, I have very small, your narrow hips. hips. go bigger yeah. as well or, or yeah. you can still have small hips and be... Quite a large I'm person, not you know? too sure about that, to be honest. But I, yeah, I have very small hips and a very narrow pelvis. And I know from my family experience that that actually runs in my family. So my grandmother's first child was, um, they had significant brain damage coming through the birth canal and ended up dying a couple of hours oh, later. Um, and I know that my auntie had, had to have C-sections as well because of a narrow pelvis. Turns out two of my cousins after... I have had Elijah, have had similar issues as well. So it's obviously a genetic thing for our family. I had a fantastic doctor that recognised that very early on. Um, I also have a defected spine as well. So actually... What does that mean? So I'm missing pieces of bone in the bottom of my spine. So it's called a spondylolisthesis or a spars defect. Um, so my spine actually slips forward and I don't have as much kind of structural integrity in my spine. So holding a baby who was almost four kilos and 55 centimetres long <laughs> when you are 165 centimetres tall and weigh about 58 kilos was, not was interesting. Mention, not to mention super wriggly if I could go by uh, yep, what he's No, like he now. was. He didn't stop. Um, so we had to have a C-section because he was actually stuck in my pelvis. I had to use the forceps to get him out even with a C-section because he couldn't engage my pelvis. was that small and he was that big. So, incredible. yeah, so lucky we flagged that early on and I'm very grateful for my doctor. Um, if I do ever have a healthy pregnancy again, I'll be going straight back to him because he was, he was phenomenal and to act that very early. So, um, so yeah, my son was born. Um, like I said, birth was pretty good. Um, and then seven days later, we moved to Canberra. So I moved states with a seven-day-old, which if anyone is thinking about doing that, just don't. Don't do it to yourself. It's not a fun time. <laughs> um we had to, obviously. My husband's in the army, so we, we got um, transported down to sit to Canberra, but that was difficult. I didn't really know anyone in Canberra, um, so I'd left all my supports behind, um, all my family behind. I did know a couple of people here just from um, my husband being in the army and friends that he had, um, but the first couple of the first couple of months were, were pretty isolating. Um, I was very, very blessed to find an amazing mother's group um, who I met some some beautiful friends through and I'm still good friends with a lot of those today. I'm actually catching up with one of them and their little boy who's born on the same day as my son, five minutes apart. How did you um, connect with that? Is that is it a Facebook thing? No, it's it through a- the so the community mental health actually connected me. So they do that for first time mums. Um, so they connect you with a mother's group and there's about oh, don't quote me, I can't remember, mum brain. Um 
there's a certain amount of sessions that they run with a nurse through the community mental health. So we all, they get you all together and every week you go and um, meet there. And then if you want to continue on meeting after, I think it might be like eight weeks, but again, don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and every week you go in and they sometimes have someone present. Like I remember a lady from ACT playgroups came in and told us all about playgroups. Um, we talked about the issues that we were having, breastfeeding issues, sleep. Sleep is always a topic because... Babies don't want Probably to sleep. only featured once, right? A sleep they only features once. I wasn't yeah. allowed to because Elijah started <laughs> sleeping from eight weeks through. So I was, was very quickly not allowed to talk and I realised I really wanted to make friends. And I was like, if I talk about the fact that my child is sleeping eight hours, I'm not going to make any friends here. I need to just like zip it. Um, but that did mean that any time Elijah did have problems with sleep, wasn't allowed to say anything either. I was like, no, nah, you've had like two months of straight sleep. No, nah. yeah. which is yeah. fair enough. You don't, so. uh, you don't meet the criteria for for no. Um, complaining. No, I certainly didn't. I certainly didn't, which which I could understand. So, um, but yeah, look, that mothers group um, was kind of my saving grace. I think in Canberra, it really gave me a sense of community and just, just some people to hang out with and to talk to, and just having having other people that were going through the same thing at the same time, going through the same struggles at the same time having the same thoughts, the same feelings as you is just, it was just really, really important for me. And mm. one of the reasons that the first year of Elijah's life was, was as good as what it was. This is kind of like a big broad question, but what is it like being a first time mum? Hazy. I don't remember much because I was very tired. Um, like I said, like Elijah fed easy. So my milk came in under 24 hours. And that's pretty unheard of. Like, I remember the nurses looking at me like I was an alien. I'm first time mum. No idea what's going on. Just like, yeah, that's normal. I've just had a baby. Of course my milk's come in. They're like, no, this should take about a week. Um, and mine was after a C-section in under 24 hours. So, and he fed beautifully. So I just, and then he started. Well, he was hungry. He was over four kilos. He was oh, like, yeah, no, he needed, <laughs> clearly needed to grow more. Like, oh, God. So he put on, I think, 450 grams every week for like the first eight to nine weeks of his life. Um, so I just, and like I said, like, we were just so blessed with him. Like, and he did, he went through stages of not sleeping well, but he was generally a pretty good sleeper. Um, he was a fantastic eater. The only problem was carrying him around was really hard because with a bad back and a child that very quickly weighed five, six, seven kilos and now weighs 17 kilos as a three-year-old. Um, my poor back is not getting any better. Um, but yeah, look, it's- You're a strongman competition uh, candidate. I know, the up. rest of my body is just deteriorating with my muscle, except for my arms. I'm like, I reckon they're getting stronger even though I'm not going to the gym. So at least he's doing something, <laughs> destroying the rest of it, but the arms look okay. Maybe. <laughs> he's going to overtake you shortly. He will, yes. He's already up to my hip. He's already about half my height. So not that it's very hard to overtake me. Um, but yes, he's strangely very tall. We're not too sure where that came from. But um, I promise my husband he's not the milkman's baby. He's, <laughs> he's definitely, he's, although he's blonde, both my husband and I are very dark and he's no, blonde no and longer, tall. It's no longer the milkman. It's now the FedEx, right? You know, I don't there, know. There's more uh, uh, eBay parcels and, and, and uh, Amazon parcels. No, no. There's probably a lot of conspiracies out there with a lot of people when they have a look at us and realise he looks nothing like either of us. Um, <laughs> but it can convenient at times. I've known it's not mine. It doesn't look like me. It's three o'clock in the morning. He's definitely yours. You need to go get him. He's yours now. He's yours now. Off you go. He might not look like you, but I swear he is. <laughs> but no, I look, being a mum, I remember one of the ladies that I used to work with told me before I, before I had him and they said, it'll be the most rewarding but the hardest thing you ever do. And that is so true. And I don't think there's any better way of explaining motherhood at the end of the day it is challenging it is taxing but it's it's so rewarding and I wouldn't change it as much as we didn't plan him and I don't know if we were 100% ready for him um we wouldn't change a thing and he's brought so much joy to not only mine and my husband's life but my whole family and like his little friends at daycare and he's he's just such a beautiful beautiful little kid so yeah, look, motherhood has, has changed me as well. It changes it changes your perspective on things. It changes your values and the things that you think are important and how you want to spend your time. And it's made me a more anxious person as well. Like I've never never worried more being a mum. I say I think someone also described it as literally having your heart ripped out and having it watch having to watch it run around around you and not have 100% control 
over that and how kind of terrifying that can be at times. And there's definitely times that I can relate to that as well. Um, but like I said, it wouldn't change it for the world. It changes how much you worry though. It does. Yeah, it does. I just probably very ignorantly, I just, I never worried about things before I had kids. Um, and before I probably had the journey that we've been on for the last two years, like I would worry about some things, but not, not much. I was very kind of happy go lucky, um, but like pretty easy going, although some friends might disagree with that. Um, but never really, never worried about bad things happening. Never worried about my health. Um, and not only now do I worry about Elijah, I now worry about my husband and I more as well, because what would happen to him if something happened to us like no one can take our place as much as someone else could do a good job of raising him they're not they're not us and he needs us at the end of the day so um what do you reckon happens uh you know obviously you've got a psychologist hat you know you've got the lived experienced uh, hat what do you think happens what, what what is it that 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 occurs to make us you know, as, as you say, it's almost like instinctively go into a more worried space. I think it's probably, look, the responsibility that they are 100% your responsibility um, becomes a component of it as well. Um, but I think as well, just knowing that if anything happened to them, the amount of heartbreak that you would get and that you would go through. And that terrifies people. That terrifies me at the end of the day. And I have someone since then who has gone through significant heartbreak trying to have another child and so I know what that is like and how painful and how challenging it is and the idea of going through that for anyone is is quite terrifying and that's I think cause where the worry comes from as well is because if anything did happen, it would tear to pieces. Do you ever think about it? Do I think about something happening something to Elijah? Something awful happening, yeah. Um, Whether it's be to you or to Elijah, to Jack. Every now and then, not not too often. Um, and I find that I'm able to kind of snap out of that headspace very, very quickly at the end of the day. I might sometimes find myself just in a bit of a daydream if I'm a bit bored, which is never because I've got a lot of things to do. But like <laughs> driving around Sydney, I often get a little bit bored. And all of a sudden, I'll just start daydreaming about like the house burning down and how I would get to Elijah and then I'm with Elijah. But how do I get to Jack? Because my so, my husband would sleep through a fire. Like he would sleep through an army attack. I'm not too sure how he's been to war before, honestly. Um, but he's such a sound sleeper. So just and just things like that. And then, then I notice that I'm kind of in this, it's more of a, um, a visual thing for me. I'm a much more visual person. Um, and then I just kind of have to, as Swifty always says, shake it off and just kind of go, nah, that's not happening. No, Natalie, that's not going to happen. We're fine. He's fine. We're all good. Um, and kind of pull myself out of that stage. But like it can happen. It happens every now and then. I think it does to most parents. Yeah, yeah. Continue on with the story. Um, so my husband and I got married a year and a half ago, so in February. Um, and we – so when my son was about six months old, look, I – my husband is just, he's the most amazing father that I could ever imagine for Elijah. And like I said, I don't think either of us were ready for it, but becoming a dad, I've just seen him embrace it and take it on in a way that honestly I didn't expect. Um, when I had to tell him we were pregnant, I had to go out and tell him to turn the PlayStation off so I could tell him we were having a baby. Like, and then he went from that to just being like the most amazing, doting, most beautiful father. Um, and I remember Elijah was only about six months old and he came to me one night in bed. I still remember this. He's like, oh, I want another one. And I was just like, man, I'm still breastfeeding. Like I haven't had my body back. Until you can learn to carry these things, no, like not happening. And he's just like, well, I would if I could. And I'm like, well, you can't. So zip that one. No, we'll get through the wedding. We'll have a chat about that. Did it change Did it change how you looked at Jack to see that other – or to see that side that obviously you couldn't have seen because – Yeah, it definitely – my love for him grew at the end of the day. And my – like I always knew that he had that in him at the end of the day, and I had no doubt that he would be that father at the end of the day. Um, but seeing that definitely warmed my heart quite a lot and made me very sure of the person that I'd chosen to spend the rest of my life with, which is a nice feeling. I never want to question that. <laughs> That's a big decision. But yes, Until he said, maybe we should try again. <laughs> well, then I questioned his sanity um, more so than anything. I was like, I think you need to go see Nash. Um, <laughs> something going wrong up there. 
But you know what? He, he loved being a dad and he still does love being a dad. And so I said, look, let's just get through the wedding because I don't want to be pregnant at the wedding. He's like, that'd be beautiful. I'm like, no. Um, so I said, let's just get through the wedding. So straight away after the wedding, come on, Nat. I was like, all right, look, look, let's just get through the honeymoon and then we'll start trying. So he's like, okay, well, so at our honeymoon, we started trying for number two. Um, and in typical Natalie and Jack fashion, got pregnant straight away. Um, so went in with very- So how did all that kind of uh, happen? <laughs> <laughs> Honeymoon, baby. Put two and two together, Nash. You no, got two kids. The next podcast. <laughs> no. <laughs> private life. Stay private. I'll be in trouble otherwise. Um, yeah, so we fell pregnant straight away, um, which was kind of, I suppose, no surprise to us. Um, That's unusual for a lot of people though, isn't it? It is unusual for a lot of people. Um, and I remember like everyone saying to me, prepare yourself. It doesn't always happen for people very quickly and going, no, we fell pregnant with Elijah so easily. We'll fall pregnant straight away and kind of going, and then I kind of took a step back and went, oh, you've got to be careful here, Nat. Like you're going in a little bit cocky. Um, it does take people years, sometimes months at the end of the day. I think I read somewhere, and I'm completely, you know, potentially talking out of line here, but uh, I think it might be on average somewhere in the vicinity of, of, of a year. That it yeah, takes I think it is actually. Bit, which kind of says to us, If it's taken, you know, uh, one month or, say, two months uh, for a couple, we're on the kind of, you know, 23, 24 month for another couple to hit that average. So, you know, the average is high. The average is high. 12 months, if if that's correct, and I I, I think it is. I think it is, yeah. Yeah. So, hence why kind of everyone around me was going – don't go into this kind of thinking that because you'll be really disappointed if you don't. Um, But lo and behold, we did. Um, So, and again, like we went into that pregnancy quite ignorant, to be honest. Um, So I started getting pregnancy symptoms. I went in for like one blood test, confirmed pregnancy. I might have went in for another one too. So in your pregnancy at the start, your what they call your HCG, so your basically your pregnancy hormone in your blood has to double every twenty four to forty eight hours. So I think I did one blood test and two days later did another one. Saw that it was doubling and went great. Okay, cool. Um, because of the scare that we did have with Elijah at the start, we said, look, no early scans because there's obviously so much margin for error. We'll just do the scan at the end of the first trimester around the 12-week mark, which is when they generally do a scan to check for viability. Um, so then you go on to your second trimester. They also check for um, any kind of chromosomal issues, especially Down syndrome. So we thought we'll just wait. Did you do how many tests? Or the skin fold or something else? Yeah, so we we did actually do the harmony test, but um, so about five weeks I started getting symptoms again um, and felt really, really crook. Um, just all of a sudden one day it was just like, wow, I feel nauseated. Um, at five weeks? At around, yeah, around five, five and a half weeks. And then six and a half to seven weeks, I just woke up and just felt better. And the symptoms were just gone. I was like this is really weird. Like I was so sick with Elijah. This doesn't feel right. But I was still very bloated. So in pregnancy, you also have um, added progesterone. Um, so your estrogen progesterone goes up and you. The, one of the symptoms of that is you get very, very bloated. And I still had a lot of that. So I was like, well, look, I'm still very, very bloated, very, very gassy. Sorry, gross, but it is. Um, I'm still getting some symptoms. It must be okay. It'll be okay. Um, but the more it went on, I was like, oh, like I just I had this gut instinct or this feeling. I'm like, I think I've miscarried. And I remember saying to my husband and to, to other family members, I think I've miscarried. And they all looked at me and just went, you're being a bit hormonal. You're probably fine. You're gassy. You're bloated. You've got other symptoms. You've got no signs of miscarriage. There hasn't been any bleeding, no cramping, nothing like that. You're probably fine. Um, so in my hair, in my gut, I was like, oh, no, I really think something's wrong. I think I need to go for an earlier scan to check if everything's going on. Um, now, because of the scan, my husband really didn't want to, um, and I didn't really want to either. So I kind of, and then he actually, again, went away, um, and I didn't want to go do that scan without him either, and he had to go down to Melbourne for, I think, about three to four weeks. Um, so I was like, okay, well, look, when he gets back, it's 11 weeks. There's no point going in at 11 weeks. We'll just wait for the 12. Um, so at the 10-week mark, you can do that harmony test, which is a, a blood test that will actually check the baby's chromosomes. Okay. So that you oh, can, that what it is? yeah. So you get the sex of the gender as well, because obviously that's in your chromosomes, but it's a, like it 
doesn't test for everything, but tests for a lot of chromosomal abnormalities, such as like Down syndrome and trisomy, things like that. So we did do that, um, but only a couple of days after that, I was actually here at work and I went to the bathroom and noticed that I had started bleeding and panicked, ran out the door, nearly like bowled our poor receptionist over as I was running out the door. Um, and I was very lucky that my mum and my dad were actually here at the time because my husband was in Melbourne. Um, so my dad went and picked up my son from daycare and kept him and my mum met me at the hospital. Um, so went to the hospital and look, the emergency staff were fantastic. They took me straight in, um, took my HCG. So I took blood tests. I don't know what that I never actually got that result back, so I don't know what it was. Um, But I told them what was happening and they sent me down for an ultrasound. Um, And at that point, um, I could tell very early from straight away as soon as I could see the ultrasound that there was something very wrong Um, because I was meant to be 11 weeks and you should be able to see the figure of a baby at the end of the day. And I could see a very, very small little circle, which is what they call the gestational sac. And it was empty. So... I knew very early on that that was what they call a blighted ovum. So basically, and the sac was measuring six weeks. Sorry, seven weeks. It was measuring seven weeks. So right at that time where my symptoms stopped was when the pregnancy actually didn't progress. So um, they, either the baby didn't implant and never actually grew or it did grow and it perished and it can actually disintegrate over that period of time but because it had been – quite a period of time between seven and 11 weeks um, they couldn't actually confirm exactly what had happened but just that it wasn't going to be a viable pregnancy and that I was in fact miscarrying. What was that like for you? Absolutely devastating. Um, I remember first of all feeling really angry. I felt really angry at everyone for not listening to me. I just said, and the first thing I said was I told you all there was something wrong and none of you listened to me and I felt yeah, really, really angry. And then about 30 seconds later, it was just just disbelief and grief. Um, And I was just wailing. I remember apologising to the ultrasound tech about 15 times for being a complete emotional mess. Um, So I got taken back to emergency and discharged because they said the the miscarriage was already starting to happen naturally um, so that I would continue to try and miscarry naturally um, to avoid any kind of operation and was sent home with the directions of if I was soaking a pad un- more than in less than an hour or had pain that wasn't able to be taken away by like simple Nurofen and Panadol to come back into emergency. Were your parents there with you? My mum was there with me. My husband was still in Melbourne, so I had to actually call him. Um, So I called him when I left work and said, um, I'm bleeding. I think I'm miscarrying. Um, And he called and said, look, I." but it was about five o'clock in the afternoon at that point and he was still in his course. So there was no way of him actually getting home that night. Unfortunately, he's like, I can try to get on a plane. I said, look, we don't know anything bad is happening because there is other reasons that you can bleed during your first trimester of pregnancy. And I was still trying to be a little bit hopeful, even though I kind of knew in my gut that it wasn't going to end well. Um, So I said, look, just wait till we confirm it with the doctor. And then you can either get on a plane tonight or you can come tomorrow morning. So I had to tell him over the phone that we had lost, that our baby had died um, and that the pregnancy wasn't going to be progressing. And I more felt for him that night, to be honest, because he was in a little room by himself with no one around. And as you can imagine, just wanted to be home with me. Um, so he got a flight home very early the next morning. I think he was on like a six o'clock flight or something. It was home by seven. Um, and we just spent the next two days just kind of trying to come to terms with what happened and waiting really because the the actual natural miscarriage didn't start. That was on the Monday. The natural miscarriage didn't actually st- really kind of kick off until the Wednesday What's all that like? You know, you're you're now at home. You know, Jack's back with you, and you're kind of waiting. <sighs> very you quiet. Remember? Yeah, no, I I do remember. Um, very quiet, very sad, and we were very careful to try not to get too upset in front of Elijah because he does like say so he was almost two at the time. So this was September. Um, so he was almost two at the time. Um, so he understood what was going on um, and if he saw mum and dad sad he was 
he'd get quite distressed. So we were trying very hard to kind of put on a brave face for him. Um, Did he know that? Uh, no. No, okay. no, not with that one. He was a bit too... He might have known. I can't remember actually. Maybe he did. He definitely knew with the last two. Maybe not the first one because he was a little bit young. No, he did know. Sorry, he did know. Um, but he was a bit too young to really comprehend what it was um, and what had happened. And he never really asked about it again after the first one. You guys, I imagine, still had those conversations potentially around. You know, you're going to have a, you know, a, a brother or a sister. So, so yeah, we'd um, we'd already got like little books as well to read him because we yeah. were quite far on. Like we thought we were quite far yeah, on in our first yeah. trimester. So we had got him little books to read about a new baby entering the world and try to start to prepare him for that, um, which is pretty heartbreaking when he asked to read those books a couple of nights afterwards and we kind of just put them in the back of the cupboard and went there for, there for future cross family. I can feel my gut sinking as yeah, you said that. Was that, that was that kind of like yeah? That was that was pretty rough. Um, more so, I think, from my husband because he's the one that reads to Elijah over night time. Um, but yeah, he just couldn't he couldn't look at them. We had to kind of put them away, um, which which we did. Um, and like I said Elijah was very resilient at the time. He didn't really he didn't really understand what was going on. Um, so we kept him in daycare so that and then the Tuesday Jack and I just had a day to ourselves. I think we went to the movies. And just tried to try to get out, tried to just do something other than just sit at home and feel miserable. Try and do just something. quote unquote normal things or just, something. Just anything. Anything would do. Just anything. Anything would do. Um, so we put him in daycare and then – Did you talk about it a lot or, or did you both kind of just skirt around the edges? How, how did you guys do it? We, we did a bit. Like and I definitely like – I will talk more than my husband. Hello, I'm a psychologist. Of course I will. Um, he's I an army man. I <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, who would Natalie talking? No. Anyone who knows me is just like, she's the most quiet person in the world. Definitely not. Um, yeah, look, we did talk about it. There was well, just more a lot of tears, really a lot of hugs. Um, yeah, there's just a lot, a lot of tears, really, and just kind of just a lot of comfort. But then also – Still trying to put on a brave face and still do the normal mum things. I still had to get up. I still had to cook dinner because my son still needed food. I still had to take him to daycare the next day. Um, I still had to wash him, bath him, read him his books, put him to bed, wake up with him in the middle of the night if he got up. I can't remember if he did or not. But, um, yeah, mothering, it doesn't stop at the end of the day, even no matter what you're going through. It doesn't stop. Um, my parents weren't there anymore either. They had gone back up to Sydney to just to give us some space as a family, um, which was which was good. I think we needed that. Do you feel that? Um, and not suggesting that it, well, it's right or, or wrong, but do, do, do you think it might have helped that it, it was a natural distraction or it was a natural responsibility that Elijah's still there and you know all those things, or, or did it kind of just feel extra heavy because? You a know, little bit of both. Both. Yeah, both. a little bit of both. Like it did, it gave me a reason to get off out the couch and it gave me a reason to actually get things done and to get out of the house. Um, but I'm not going to lie, there was definitely times where I didn't feel like I had the capacity to do that and there was definitely times where I couldn't do things and Jack had to get up and actually do them. Um, so, yeah, definitely a little bit of both. And especially like through the recovery as well, it's still a little bit of both, like not just for those couple of days but afterwards. Um, yeah, definitely kind of helps to just get on and like we Jack and I are very kind of we'll, we will experience what we've experienced and we will feel what we need to feel but we will also try to continue to live in a very values based way and do what we need to do and try to get on with our lives as well and we really didn't want it to kind of monopolize our lives and our lives to become all about this miscarriage at the end of the day in some sense kind of like both grieving and living yeah, 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 exactly. Both in the just, same time. And I, I once had a client explain this in a way and I just went, you know what, that explains exactly what it's like. She's like, I'm okay, but I'm living with pain. And I just went, that's exactly what it's like. I was, I was, I was okay, I was getting on with things, but I was living with pain. And I was living with grief that no one could see at the end of the day. Um, I did talk about it a little bit um, and a few of my kind of close friends knew, but not not too many. Um, I didn't – I but me much more open kind of as much our journeys progressed. Um, but after the first one, um, yeah, I didn't, didn't open up mm. too much. We just really focused on 
getting through it physically um, because – so on the Wednesday – um, the, it really actually started to kick up. Um, and the miscarriage went really, really, really bad, unfortunately for me. And I do want to preface this by saying that what happened to me is extremely, extremely rare. It doesn't happen to the majority of people. It would be a very minute percentage, um, of people that this happens to. But, um, I remember dropping Elijah off at the daycare and only having kind of very, very, very mild cramps, like maybe a one out of 10, like nothing much. And then all of a sudden, I started getting contraction like pain and it would have been about an eight out of 10. Like it was, it was excruciating and I would feel like a contraction and then the urge to push kind of like you're giving birth at the end of the day. And all of a sudden, and I'm sorry for anyone who is squeamish here is, was just gushes of blood that would come out and I would just have to race to the toilet and there would just be, it was just gushing. And I remember thinking, this is what the doctors were talking. This is what the nurses were talking about. I was filling a pad in 15 minutes into the day and I just I started feeling quite lightheaded and going, I'm going to need some strength to get through this because the pain would come and go at the end of the day. It wasn't constant. Like it was very much like a contraction. Something needed my uterus was contraction to try and get everything out. Um, it would get a little bit out and then it would calm down for a little bit, but they would happen every kind of 45 seconds to a minute. So they were pretty regular. That's very regular. Yeah. So it was pretty regular. Um, and I remember calling the, so they gave me a number to call um, for the, like the women's clinic or whatever it is in the, in the hospital. I can't remember exactly what it's called. Um, and I said, look, I do have some stronger pain relief left over from an operation that I had um, a couple of months ago. They said, look, take that, um, which was an endone. So they said, take the endone. If after 30 minutes, the pain is still as bad as what you're saying, call an ambulance. Or if you pass out at all, call an ambulance. I remember going, I've never passed out in my life. I'm not going to pass out. We'll take an endone. That's pretty strong. This will help with the pain. They weren't overly concerned with passing of blood. They were more concerned about pain levels I think at the, that time. Yeah, I think the pain levels are more an indication of how bad it's going for them because you still can have gushes, but if it's not that painful, it's generally a sign that it's actually going okay. But again, I'm not a doctor, so sure, this is that just, my, just like, this is my experience. So after 30, and I remember saying to my husband, look, because we hadn't really been shopping because we'd been pretty miserable, I was like, look, I'm going to need some food to get through the day. I'm actually kind of feeling hungry. Um, can you go down, get some food? And he said, I don't want to leave you. I don't want to leave you. I said, Jack, I'm fine. I'm okay. But I'm, I'm going to really need like some food to get through this because this is – it was just really hard on my body and I could tell that it was hard on my body and I knew that my body needed some sustenance to get through. So reluctantly, he went down to the shops, which is only like a five-minute drive from our house. He was gone for maybe 20 minutes. Um, and as soon as he left, the pain got worse, the gushes got worse, and I started getting very, very, very lightheaded to the fact that when Jack got home, he found me almost passed out unconscious on the couch. And Do I you remember was, what you were thinking at, at, at that time? I remember thinking, stay awake, stay awake, you need to stay awake, you need to stay awake, you need to stay awake. Don't fall asleep, don't fall asleep, you might not wake up, you need to stay awake. And you just need to stay awake until Jack comes home. So Jack came home and I vividly, I vividly remember the look on his face and he just burst into tears and just called an ambulance very, very quickly. Um, and then I don't really remember, I think I might have passed out then because I don't really remember much after that. I remember hearing him say, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. Um, and I then, like my memory here is really phasey because I think I was quite in and out of consciousness. Then I remember the ambulance turning up and just feeling this sense of relief that I was going to be okay the ambulance were there and they were going to take. And I remember saying to myself, you need to keep telling yourself you're safe here, Nat, that you're going to be okay. Otherwise, psychologically, you could be in problem. And I'm amazed that I had that insight at that time. It's to incredible go, to be kind of wake up and, and start thinking. Yeah, I was just in protective mode physically and psychologically of going, you need to tell yourself you're going to be okay. Because if you tell yourself that you might go to sleep and not wake up, you might end up with PTSD. So you need to tell yourself you're safe. And continue to tell myself, then when the ambulance got there, I'm going to be safe. I'm going to be okay. They're going to look after me. I'm going to be okay. Um, I don't remember getting into the ambulance. I remember them kind of asking me some vague questions. Like I said, my memory is very hazy because I'm very out of it. Um, but then I remember kind of coming to in the ambulance with the worst pain of my entire life because it turns out there was a ginormous blood clot that was stuck 
that could not get out because my um, cervix actually wasn't dilating properly and it was trying to get out but it couldn't and I felt like my insides were going to burst open. And they had given – I can't take morphine because I'm allergic to morphine. Um, And they kept trying to give me all this other medication. But because when I take morphine, I get violently ill, I was quite reluctant to take anything because I was like, I'm already going through physical health. I don't need to be vomiting Mm -hmm. on top of this as well. Um, So I was like, no, no, no. They're like, look, you – and then when that happened, I was like, look, I need something. And they gave me this green whistle. I don't know what's in it, but, Jesus, if anyone ever has problems – on that thing. I've heard of the green whistle. Oh, God. It's, it's, Apparently it's for magic. the next couple of days in hospital, that's all I was asking the nurses for was this green whistle. And I was trying to like suck <laughs> the last little bits out of it. My husband took it off me and I think he got copped an earful. <laughs> I think I might have also been going around going, blow my whistle because I think I was a bit high. Um, God knows what I was doing. I don't want to know. Thank God no one had a camera there. Um, but I remember just scream when I got to hospital and I was in the hallway and I was screaming. I was screaming in pain and I just felt like my whole body was going to explode. And I was physically screaming. So they raced me in and um, put a speculum in and actually removed this blood clot, um, which was like they showed us and it was quite – it was like the size of kind of two fists put together really. Um, So then the pain kind of subsided after that. Um, And they offered me a DNC at that point, which I said yes to. Um, And at that point – What's a DNC? So a DNC is a dilation and curatage, which they um, they put you under general anaesthetic and they basically – so a curatage is like a spoon – the end of the day and they kind of put it, insert it through your cervix and scrape all of the products is what they call make, it out. How do you make a decision? Oh, I just know, couldn't in, do it anymore. In, 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 in I was, all of this sort of going on and you're, you're still being asked the question, right? Yeah. So I was asked the question. I don't know why I was asked the question because I asked for it and then they said I could have it and then they turned it away and said no. Um, so I, as soon as that happened and I kind of came to, I felt the onset of a panic attack um, and I just started panicking and very quickly was able to utilise my own psych knowledge and did some deep breathing and some guided imagery, deep breathing and calm myself right down. Um, so that only lasted for about maybe 30 seconds to a minute and I'm very blessed that I knew how to do that at the end of the day. Um, it's interesting that you could kind of... I don't, don't know how. You could was witness in this there. stuff, you could see it. You kind of, it's almost like you, in some sense, became a part of the observer yeah. at, at the time of, you know, at first, when you, when you first woke up out of being uh, unconscious of saying, you know, I've got to be positive, you know, the ambulance are here, they're going to look after me, things are going to be good, it's going to be fine. Yeah. And then in this other sort of moment, you know, also kind of saying, okay, I know what's happening. Yeah. Um, I know what this is. I've heard it solution, talked about a call. Solution focused. Like, yeah. you, you're on it. You, you, you were kind I was of very protective of myself. Of for yourself. Yeah, I was definitely in protective mode of myself. Um, because I was already feeling very, very vulnerable and knew that I needed to kind of step up and protect myself at that point. So I got offered the DNC um, and then they came back and denied me a bit because I was too stable. And then kind of went, damn, I should have actually had a panic attack. Maybe I would have actually got in for the operation. Um, So they then unfortunately lost me for 24 hours, put me in the wrong ward, um, sent my husband home. So they should have actually taken me to the pregnancy unit. They put me in the the short stay unit. So for people who have had um, operations. So I was in the room with about... I don't know, like maybe 20 other people, everyone snoring. I got absolutely no sleep. Um, They didn't give me any pain relief for 24 hours. Um, It was – I remember nurses coming up and complaining and telling me that I needed to complain um, because I was just left to my own devices. I was left – again, sorry, I was left in a pool of my own blood for two hours because no one would actually help me out. What's going on through your head at that moment? Just pure anger. Just pure anger. anger. Yeah, Yeah, just pure anger of just going – this is just unacceptable. Um, the only way that I actually then got in to get a ultrasound was I threatened to discharge myself and I was signing the discharge papers to go home before they then came and got me. They told me they would be there at 8 o'clock in the morning to take me for an ultrasound. I think it was about 3.30 in the afternoon before they actually came and got me to take me for an ultrasound to see what was going on. Um, so they did that. They took me for an ultrasound and sure that I still had tissue and what they call products left inside. Um, so my natural miscarriage was not complete at all. Um, it must have been something about the internal ultrasound that then triggered it all off again. So again, the pain, the contractions, the gushing of blood all happened again and my blood pressure... Post the internal ultrasound. Post the internal ultrasound. So my blood pressure then dropped significantly um, to the fact that, again, I was kind of in and out of consciousness and they kept coming and taking my blood pressure and going, this is dangerously low. I'm like, I know that. 
you need to take me in for the surgery now. They said, no, we can't, we're too busy. Um, and just kept for the next 24 hours, just pumped me through a IV fluids to try and keep my blood pressure high, which just, if you've had a baby, your blood is shot. So I just was up every 45 minutes going to the toilet. So again, got no sleep that night either, maybe two hours max of very unbroken sleep. Um, What's going through your head at this moment? I was so delirious by that point. I don't even know. Like I was frustration as well. Like I remember they kept doing internal exams as well and they came in to do another one and I just said, no, I said, you were starting to violate me. I'm feeling violated and I know you need to stop right now because if you keep going, that can have psychological impacts of me. And they kind of looked at me and said, no, I'm a psychologist. I'm quite aware of what this can do. You need to stop. No more. I'm either so bad that you need to take me into emergency surgery right now or you need to leave me alone. They two options. And I am really proud that I actually kind of stood up for myself and just didn't let them kind of keep doing what they wanted to do because I was I was at the end of my rope by that point. Um, so 10 o'clock the next morning, they finally took me in for the operation. Um, they told my husband I would be 30 minutes. I think I was nearly two hours. So that poor bugger was sitting there for a lot longer than what they told him I was going to be. Um and then it also then turns out that they didn't do the DNC properly and that actually left tissue behind. So I, after, after I got out, my blood pressure was still very, very low. Um, and again, I had to discharge myself at five o'clock in the afternoon because they wouldn't let me go until the OBs came to see me, but they were too busy to come and see me. So I just, I said, I've had enough. I'm done. I can't, I just, I could not be there anymore. I was broken. I was hurting and I was just, I'd lost all hope in that hospital, to be honest. And I just that feeling that I needed of being safe, I wasn't having that anymore at that hospital and I needed to go, I needed to be at home, like I needed to I needed to hug my son, I needed to be in my own bed, I just, I needed to get out of there and not eat hospital food because that's not, that's not very nice either. It seems like there's still a bit of anger there and I'm not suggesting yeah. that there shouldn't be. Um, yeah, look. Is, is, that, is that part of why in terms of that in the place where you wanted to feel safe, where you should feel safe, yeah. you you found yourself feeling unsafe, where you felt yourself being vulnerable. That's I felt like I wasn't treated heard. like I felt like I wasn't treated like a human. To oh be honest, gosh. that's how I felt at the time. I just felt disregarded, just tossed aside, like I just didn't matter when I was going through something. That was really like, so the nurses were amazing and they gave me forms to put in complaints about the hospital at the end of the day and going, this is not okay. This is abhorrent. You should not be treated like this. You shouldn't be in this ward. You should be. They did end up moving me to the pregnancy ward where my husband could stay overnight, which did make the difference. I was in a room by myself so I could actually, well, I should have been able to get some sleep except they put me with IV thrills all night so I couldn't. Um, so that was better when I got there. And I will say the nurses were amazing. I just think that the hospital is just understaffed. Like they just, you couldn't even have a meeting with the gynecologist without her phone ringing every 30 seconds. So I did feel for the doctors as well. Like they were clearly very run off their feet, very understaffed, but it's still not okay at the end of the day for someone to come in, going through a miscarriage, losing their baby and to made to feel inhuman is just, and yeah, look, I think I will be angry about that for a while. Like it's not something that I hold with me and it's not something that affects me from day to day um but when I talk about it yeah you'll probably still hear a lot of emotion in my voice because it's not okay it's not okay like I needed so much more in that moment um and subsequent miscarriages from that have brought up some symptoms of PTSD for me because of the treatment that I had unfortunately one of the things that I often see with you know post trauma or or trauma that kind of sticks with us if we can call it that yeah is often kind of like a secondary insult yeah um and i'm kind of hearing that exactly where the first insult was losing your baby yeah Uh, and then the second uh Sounds like there were many. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, look, we did get out. Um, we did go home um, and I just felt instantly better when I got home. Um, Safe? Yeah, just, you know, when you get out of hospital, right, you just see you're at home, you're in your own bed, just, just comfortable 
right? And just, yeah, like I could hug my son, I could lay on the couch with him, I could just be in my own space at the end of the day. But um, So they did tell me that my bleeding would stop after about a week. It didn't. It took five weeks, like I said, because they didn't do the operation properly and didn't get everything out. So my body continued to naturally miscarry for five weeks after that. It wasn't – it was just a lot more like like a really long period at the end of the day until about five weeks I noticed that the last kind of clot had come out and then it did really slow after that. I was like, well, that's that's the end of it finally. But it was, yeah, like six weeks worth of an ordeal really into the day to actually just physically – be through it all. What's that like to lose your baby and still be six? Well, and, and to go through this process of medical intervention and pain, and uh, d- does it change how you process or how you uh, go through the loss because you're kind of also got this other stuff going on? What was it like for you? Look, I didn't I didn't know that it was retained product until right around like that last time where the last clot came out. So I just – and they do say that every – like everybody responds differently to these things. So I I had a suspicion. I was like, look, I, I think there might be something wrong. But they generally say as well that you get fevers and like an infection from us. I was like, well, that's not happening. Maybe like because my body did go through a lot of trauma – it's just taking a little while and a little bit longer to get back to normal. And then at that five week mark, when that when the last book came out, I was like, no, that was actually retained tissue. And then it was all done. There was a a last sort of um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure what the language is, but release of of release of tissue. The, yeah, the yeah. tissue that was left over. So, and that's when I kind of really knew physically that it was going to be over, which was quite a big relief. So look, it is, miscarriages are so common. There's one in four women go through miscarriages and it's only until I kind of really started talking about it until I noticed how many of my friends and people that I know had actually gone through it. Um, when did you start talking about it? Slowly throughout. So overall we've had three now um, and through every one I've probably opened up to people a little bit more and more. Um, there was only, after the first one, only kind of really my close friends really knew. Um, I did have a really good friend of mine's hens party on um, maybe about three or four weeks after, no, maybe only two weeks after I got out of hospital and I had to kind of explain to her why I couldn't come. Um, one, because I was still physically going through it too. I didn't think drinking was going to be a very good idea because I did not want to be the emotional girl crying in the bathroom. No one wants to be that girl. Um, and I just also didn't feel comfortable being in a car because I, I was living in Canberra at the time and they were in Sydney. So I didn't feel comfortable being in the car for six hours by myself in the kind of state that I was in as well. So she was she was beautiful. She understood. Um, but that did mean that I had to kind of talk to a few people about why I wasn't there at the end of the day because I really – like being there for my friends is, is something that's really important to me and being there to celebrate really like little lovely times in their life is, is a massive value of mine and really important. So I didn't want them – I wanted them to know that there was a real genuine reason why I wasn't actually coming. It wasn't just because I lived in Canberra and couldn't be bothered or something like that. Like there was a there was a real reason for me not to come, which they all understood um, and were really, really supportive and really good about. And it was nice to be able to open up and to talk to people and, again, hear, hear more stories of other women that have gone through it. Why do you think this is – such a a common occurrence to have a miscarriage, but it's so, in some sense, unknown. Uh, I mean, I didn't know about it at all until, you know, my wife and I started to, you know, try and, you know, uh, you start kind of beginning to appreciate this, this, this world because you hear about, you know, in that space, friends and, you yeah. know, others where it where it's occurring and it, it, it seems like it's common but it was never it was never raised i mean i i don't ever remember it being raised you know with my wife and i saying ps is it because it's like kind of like quote unquote bad news to you know couples who are trying to conceive like what what, what do you what do you think why i think there's a lot of reasons um like there's a and there shouldn't be at the end of the day, and this is something like I have worked through myself, is there's there is a lot of shame when you – like, and there was for me, and I, I can't talk for everyone at the end of the day. I can only talk for myself, is that I, I just 
there was a lot of shame. I didn't really want a lot of people knowing. Um, one, like it, people, some people are very private and like I'm a little bit more open probably than most people. Um, but some people are really private and don't don't want people to know about their pain and what they go through. Um, shame of? Shame that my body couldn't do what it was meant to do. And it just, that fear that someone would go, well, was it someone that you ate or was it something that you did or what's wrong with you that you can't do this, um, which no one did at the end of the day. But just, yeah, that was kind of in the back of my head really for me. Um, because shame in some sense points blame. Yeah, and I know a lot of women who have miscarriages go through that blame of what did I do wrong or what's wrong with me. And I definitely have had many of those moments over the last year and a half of um, like did I do something wrong, overanalyzing every single little thing that you did through the pregnancy. Did I eat something wrong? Did I do something that caused this? Um, And if you feel like you have done something wrong, then you're not going to want to share that with everyone at the end of the day. Um, It's also like a difficult topic to talk about at the end of the day because there is so much emotion attached to it as well that I understand that people aren't necessarily comfortable to talk to people about losing a child um especially as well like i i try to be very careful to talk to people who are currently pregnant or trying because i don't you don't want to scare people either um and you don't want to be like well it's obviously always going to be in the back of my head now any future pregnancies that i have that anxiety is going to be there and there's an acceptance that i need to do of that because i have been through that loss three times now and the likelihood that we will go through another one is unfortunately quite high um so that fear is going to be there and I don't want to put that fear in anyone else's head either. Um, But at the same time, I knew that I needed to talk about it. I knew that I needed support and friends and people to know what I was going through. And I also wanted other people to know that if they do go through that, like I was one of the first ones in my group to have friends. Like I've got friends that have had babies and stuff as well, but we're all kind of, a lot of us are in the same space at the moment. We're all trying to have kids or having second ones or like extending our families or starting our families. And I want them to know that if that does happen to them, they've got someone to talk to who has been through it and knows what it is like. But it's it's not an easy topic to talk about. There's so much emotion attached that people won't feel comfortable. So we avoid instead of putting it on the table. Yeah. It's, I don't know if avoidance is the right word of like self-preservation. Yeah. It's probably more like the way that I would describe it at the end of the day of like not wanting to – really kind of continue to feel the emotion and relive it. Potentially for some people, they might just kind of want to put it behind them and move forward. And the more ventilation you give something, the more you feel it at the end of the day, the more it's present in your life. So they might just want to put it behind them. Everyone's journey is really, really different at the end of the day. So, Are you and Jack uh, a bit personal but uh, thinking about maybe – Trying again? Uh, Is this something you guys have put aside? Uh, Yeah. So, like I said, we've gone through two more losses since then. So, we're now um, in recurrent miscarriage mode. Um, So, they only call them recurrent once you've had three because they are so common. Um, You've got a 1% chance of having three miscarriages in a row. So, unfortunately, we fall in a very, very small category. Um, We, after the third one, did do a lot of testing um, and have subsequently found out what was causing our miscarriages. Um... So very strangely enough, even though we're full pregnant instantly, I have a very low egg reserve of I'm 30, I was 31 when I had the test done and my egg reserve is the age of a 45 year old, um, which we were very shocked at. But it also turns out that I have um, Hashimoto's um, autoimmune disorder and elevated killer cells. So basically my immune system is working way too well um, along with the autoimmune disorder and it is attacking the babies. So we have a lot of medication that we can take now that stops both of those things so we're going into next one potentially looking like much more positively hopefully um but yeah it is something that we still want to do how many times we've got left in us we don't know um but we will we will try but this is it is been it has been a a tough thing on our marriage at the end of the day like we are we are strong and we are still very much together and, and still doing quite well but we both grieve very differently as well um i am much more talking jack is much more quiet at the end of the day so um we have had to kind of navigate through that and really respect how each other grieves and 
I know he's really struggled at times kind of got knowing, not knowing how to support me and what to do um, and like I always say to him it's like just just be there and for anyone that is helping someone going through a miscarriage at the end of the day just let them talk about it if they want to right don't push them but if they if they want to talk about it, don't change the subject I had a, a few people with me change the subject when I tried to talk and I could tell that it made them uncomfortable and that just made me the shame and guilt even worse I was like oh now I'm putting these things on them and and it, it didn't help. Like if you feel like you can listen, just listen. You don't, you don't, you can't do anything to fix it. And I know that was the hardest thing for my family as well is feeling like they couldn't do anything and they couldn't do anything to take it away. Um, but the only thing they could do was just be an ear, be an ear. Don't tell them that it'll get better or that it's okay or you'll have another baby really soon or try to make it better because it's not, it's not better. It's painful. It's horrible. And I think as a psychologist, I know how to sit in that space with people. Um, and that was a challenge for me at the end of the day because I've got to remember that people outside who haven't learned that skill don't necessarily have it at the end of the day. And the people around me really had to learn mm. that skill. And it is a really important skill for anyone going through any kind of hard time and especially kind of recurrent miscarriage is to just be there. You don't need to fix it. Just be there. It's a hard one because... So often we encounter in our work loved ones who come in and say, what can I do yeah. for this person? And, and, and so often it's Nothing. in some sense, you know, it's the absence of what you do. Yeah, You know, don't do and, and, and sit alongside your loved one and be there. Yeah, uh, Kind of like how we do so in a hospital where we just sit next to our loved one and... and we don't do the medical side. Someone else does the medical side, but we're there. Yeah, and, and exactly. It makes all the, which is what's been so hard in, in, in parts of what we've discussed today when you've been by yourself because Jack was away. Yeah. You know, there's, there, 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 there's sort of that uh, alone space which can be awfully difficult or when you were lost in hospital. Yeah, look, own. that alone space, like for anyone who's gone through miscarriage is really hard and one of the things that I think really got me through um, because, like, again, one of the reasons I think it's really hard to talk about is that shame and that guilt. And I'm, as you know, I'm a very kind of cognitive behavioural th- psychologist at the end of the day. And after, especially after the second miscarriage, my mind went to a very dark place. I felt like a complete failure. Like I could not do what my body was meant to do and that I was causing so much pain for myself and my family and I went into a pretty dark depression um, for about a month there and I knew very early on that one, I needed to ask my husband to get me out of the house and do things and that when I did do these things, it wasn't going to bring as much joy as what it had previously because of the, the state that I was in, but that was okay and it was still really important for me to do them as much as I felt like I could. Um, but for me to remind myself often that even though my body was doing it, and we have found out since that it, it is my body, unfortunately. It's not something that I have control over though. And as much as it is my body, it's not something that defines me and my worth and my worth as a mother or who I am as a person. It is not something I have any control over, just like I can't control the fact that I am short or I have blue eyes or I have brown hair. Um, I don't judge myself on those and I shouldn't judge myself on the basis of what medically my body is doing that I don't have any control over. And I had to, it's not once that I had to tell myself that it's been, God, thousands of times that I have to remind myself of, it's not your fault. Didn't do anything wrong. I didn't choose this. I didn't choose to do anything wrong. And it does not define me as a person. And to make sure, like what really got me through was making sure that I stayed really true to my values and who I was. I've had lots of friends fall pregnant since then. And I've, as painful as it is, I've been there. I think I've been there as much as I possibly can. I've been there to talk to them. I drove one of my friends to hospital recently when his girlfriend was going into labour um, and left work and drove him to, to to be there for my friends and to stay true to who I was because I just didn't want this experience to change me in any kind of negative way. It has changed us and we have grown and we will find meaning in our losses, which is, again, really important to do going through any kind of loss is to find that meaning, find that growth. It's not going to turn into a positive thing in any way, shape or form, but there is so much more that my husband and I know about each other now, um, how to get through difficult times, how to grieve, because we will grieve more throughout our life and we know how to support each other better through that and what we both need. And But just remind yourself every day that you didn't do anything wrong. 
it doesn't it does not define you and it doesn't define me my experiences don't define me what I do every day defines who I am and if I can still act in a really value-based way if I can be there despite what I'm feeling if I can keep trying because giving my son a sibling is really really important to me because I love my siblings that's what's going to get me through and that's what is getting me through before we finish up Is this something that you feel you can now help others with during their time or do you feel it might be a bit close to you just talking about now? Um, No, I have like two clients at the moment that I'm actually helping through miscarriage loss as well Um, and that's one of the meanings that I found. Like I said, finding meaning in a loss I know as a psychologist is a really important part of the grieving process. And I believe this has made me a better psychologist, especially in relation to working with grief, but just even understanding mm. depression and what dark thoughts can do to you and how how much I believe in psychology and how it can get you through because it did get me through. I used so many of my own strategies um, to pull myself out of that hole and I got out of that hole within a couple of weeks very, very quickly. And again, like don't expect to be able to do anyone to be able to do that. Um, I'm very blessed to have the knowledge that I do have and the skills that I do have. Um yeah, look, I do feel like I can. Um, it depends where I'm at. Like if I'm, if we do go through another miscarriage and I'm in that space, then probably not because um, I do need my time to heal from that. Um, but especially like after our journey is over and we've got the family, um, either we have a second sibling or you know what, we choose to, like we already are thankful for our son, but if we get one, we get one and we're very grateful for the beautiful little boy that we do have and we are grateful that like if we were going to go through this, it was after we had Elijah, not before as well. Like that's been a massive kind of saving grace for us that we already we had him to go home to. Um, but yeah, like most definitely, I like I said, finding meaning for me is the thing that's going to get me through at the end of the day. And if I can help someone else, then that's a fantastic meaning. And thank you so much for coming on the show today to – to share your, you know, your lived experience. I think it's it's one of many uh, uh, women and, and men going through and, and, and couples going through uh, something that unfortunately is, is so common yeah. um, and, and, and varied. You know, there's uh, different, different experiences, but uh, they all share the same, uh, same unfortunate common denominator, which is yeah. the loss of... of a child and yeah. um, you know I, I really appreciate you speaking so candidly and openly about uh, what that's been like uh, for you and how you've gotten through and, and that this is a journey that still continues on and, yeah. and uh, is not something that um, is ever forgotten but but uh, is lived through and, and we still have some capacity around how it how it shapes us or how we remember it or how we could try and look at it and we can kind of yeah. work work on that. Yeah, exactly. Like we know from psychologists, the way that you look at something is the way that you're going to experience it at the end of the day and we can't look at this in a positive light. It's not a positive thing um, in any way, shape or form but I'm just trying to make sure that my perspective on it is as kind of functional and he- as healthy as it possibly can be, paying homage to everything that has happened and the amount of pain that myself and my family have gone through. Thanks again for coming on the show, and I, and I wish you and uh, Jack and Elijah, uh, you know, the very best with, with, with your family, um, and you know, uh, uh, we'll have to get together with our littlies at some time, and um, you know, run a muck at, at the local playground because I tell you what, sometimes you've got to go out and share share the love with. Uh, other couples to find out how crazy theirs are and, you know, hopefully yeah. they run off for a little bit so you can have a quiet coffee. Yeah, for about three seconds. Mine always comes <laughs> back the craziest though, so it never really works well for me. Um, but you know what? We love him anyway. <laughs> that, that, that's a nice note to uh, finish it off. We love our, our, our little is as much as they uh, cause us a lot of grief. <laughs> we do. We do. Sometimes it's hard, but we do. We love them to pieces, so... And that's a nice thing, I think, about that that, that, that genuine sense of uh, it's a hard process, but, you know, yeah. all the way from conception through through to, you know, if we're fortunate and lucky enough, um, 
and you know raising has its own challenges as well but that's yeah. another podcast <laughs> that's seven other podcasts <laughs> and one of which i feel you might need to get a better ex- expert than myself <laughs> and i won't be able to host that one no, either, <laughs> no we'll go to the pub <laughs> thanks natalie once again appreciate thanks. it no worries thanks nash if you enjoyed this podcast please support it by going to itunes and putting a review subscribe share it via social media and tell others about it start a conversation it's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources and just lastly if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team develop your experience and get into some exciting work come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.